Hello and welcome to DSA Presents. I'm Deirdre Silverman and my guests today are Teresa Halpert and Tom Eisenberg. We're going to be talking about issues related to affordable housing and the lack thereof in Ithaca and the rest of Tompkins County. Tom and Teresa are both members of Democratic Socialists of America and have been working on this issue as part of local DSA's Committee on Housing. So we know that there is an affordable housing crisis here. Um, there's a standard measure of housing affordability that looks at the relationship between median income and median home price and Tompkins County's is the worst in all of upstate New York. Um, we have housing prices that are double or more those of the surrounding counties. So what can we do about it? What are the issues related to it? You feel that there are a lot of misconceptions or myths about how the housing market works? Where do we go with it? Yeah, so I'd say, you know, the housing debate gets very heated locally, you know, and there's a lot of uh, support behind both, you know, in terms of voters and elected officials that the way to get out of it is to sort of, we can build our way out of it by just, you increase the housing stock and eventually prices will take care of themselves, right? You know, it's essentially if, if you increase the housing supply, the, the, the richer people will move into the highest end units and create vacancies for lower end people. And I would say that's informing a lot of the policy decisions that are happening. And I would say both of us are involved in sort of countering a lot of uh, the points that are commonly made in support of this argument. Okay, so what's wrong with that argument? Well, that's, uh, it has a name. It, the concept of just addressing the shortage by letting developers add to the supply wherever they choose to build. And because the profits are higher, they often choose to build at the top of the market. Sure. That frees up units that then become available to people with lesser incomes. That argument is called filtering, and it's been around for a long time. Um, it has a number of problems, but in particular, at the moment in history we are, it has even more problems. So first of all, it just takes too long. They do studies, 30 to 40 years, for the new housing to filter down and become affordable um, to the people of lower incomes. Um, that's when you have plenty of supply and when it's, when it's working as it's envisioned. It's still a slow process. And in 40 years, you'll have completely changed the character of your city. Um, a second problem with it is it tends to get stuck unless your market is a perfect bell curve. And, and Tom can explain what I mean in a minute. But So you've got a developer who's building at the top, Class A apartments, and now the A-minus apartments have some vacancies. So it's possible that those landlords would say, oh, I will lower my rent $100 and then I'll find tenants. But that's filtering slightly up here. Down here, where people with lower incomes, there's still a lot more people, and especially after the economy turned and people have gig jobs and part-time jobs, there are a lot more people than there are apartments, so there's upward pressure on the rents down here. So the filtering doesn't come down nicely. It tends to just sort of equilibrate toward the middle. And I'll, I'll turn it over to Tom in a second because he can explain a lot more about that. But the other problem is simply that in gentrifying cities, it fails totally because before it gets to that 40 years and it's now a cheaper rundown place, it becomes a fashionable, walkable, historic place. And if a landlord sees a vacancy, takes it off the market, puts money in, maybe puts in air conditioning, another bathroom, and now he can rent it for $200 a month more, and it attracts more well-to-do people to move into your city and uh, again forcing the um, the lower income people out in, entirely. So those are three main problems. Um, Tom is an economic grad student so he can really address the one about 
um, our income distribution. Sure. So, yeah, implicit in a lot of these filtration style arguments is, okay, you build at the top, the people right below the top, you know, move from A minus to A, etc., and eventually it works its way down to the bottom of the ladder. But implicit in this is you have a reasonable amount of people at each rung of the ladder, right? So it's not necessarily a perfect, you know, bell curve where everyone's in the middle, but there's some, you know, the hope is there's some rough approximation of that where there's enough of each kind of person locally to move into each kind of housing. And that's not necessarily true even nationally, but it's especially untrue in Ithaca. So the, we don't have, you know, a graph to show you, but if you look at the census data for Ithaca, our income distribution skews much more toward a sort of bimodal distribution where there's a reasonable number of pretty wealthy people, but there's a sort of missing middle. And then, you know, so people making sort of 40,000 to, you know, 80,000-ish, we have relatively fewer of them as compared to, say, New York State as a whole. What we have a lot of is people making around 30,000, like, probably because of grad students and people like that, and then a lot of people... Well, in a service economy. Yeah, definitely. And then a lot of people who are, you know, just making basically nothing partially, you know, as a mixture of people in extreme poverty and, you know, undergraduates who would show up as making no money um, in that kind of measure. So that sort of suggests that locally we're not in a good context for filtering to play out, uh, especially quickly or effectively, I would say. But we also have an, uh, the unusual situation you referred to, undergraduates, yes. of people whose income shows up as very low, but they can afford to pay higher rents because their families are paying for yeah. it and they're renting as groups. So there's the impact of that on the market. Yeah, and so there are a few ways that you know, I would imagine undergraduate students sort of distort our housing market. I think it's clear, you know, if you just look at the developments on, say, State Street, there are plenty of undergraduates who are able to afford extremely expensive housing, and, you know, there, there's clearly a lot of them willing to take that kind of stuff up. And so, you know, that sort of suggests, even in the official numbers, they're showing up as no income, they're not secretly in the middle, right? They're either at the top or at the bottom. And one reason you might see them more as like the bottom is a lot of undergraduates, their preference for, say, housing quality would be very different than, like, you know, a working family, right? They can pile eight people into a house in college town, but in terms of the kind of housing you'd want to have locally, that's probably not what people would be excited about. And I think it's worth mentioning that the student loan component throws another monkey wrench into the market. Uh, was it in 98 when student loans became non-dischargeable? Then it became much easier to get them because you can, you can never mm -hmm. declare bankruptcy yeah. from... I mean, it's difficult. You can do it in rare cases, but it's, you're stuck with the student loans. So that allowed people to access more money. So if so undergraduates are not going to commute from outside the county. That would be too far away. So if rents are high in college town, they'll take more onto their loan. So it's a distortion because it pushes rents up for others, but it also saddles that generation with debt that really uh, isn't isn't really um, fair, I think, for society. Okay, so how is this, the filtration argument, which is basically a market-based argument, the market will, you know, let the market go and it will solve the problems. Um, how is that playing out here? I mean, I think at least anecdotally and, you know, in yearly reports, we're clearly not seeing drastic rent decreases. You know, you might get some levels of some quality of housing 
to decrease a little bit year over year. But it's, it's like Teresa was saying, any decrease you see is very modest, and it's very transitory. And for the kind of, you know, change we would need to see, it seems, it seems clear that it's going to take, you know, decades maybe at this rate. So I would say it's not playing out especially well. Right. I actually meant how is it playing out in policy uh, related yeah. to housing. So do you want to maybe? Well, are, are you asking... Uh, how is that theory informing the policy decisions uh, that are okay. being made around housing? So I think right now in vogue in our local government is the concept that what we have is a shortage of housing. We should facilitate the building of more housing and then everyone will eventually have housing. So one issue is also the, just the income inequality in, in the whole U.S. is back to what it was before the income tax or whatever. So, so as a small landlord, I often look at the new projects and, and I say, oh, look, this one opened and it's 2200 for a one-bedroom apartment. How, how are they filling this? And someone in the city government said, yes, it's all filled. And I said, but I walk by and it's dark. So he said, well, that's because um, those apartments are rented by people from downstate whose children are professors at Cornell and they keep an apartment here so that they can visit. So in other words, it's people... Professors or students? The parents of professors oh. that, or pe young people work at Cornell mm -hmm. from, from somewhere else and now they want to visit, mm -hmm. their parents want to visit the grandchildren. So they have an apartment in the city but they have a lease up here and when they come to visit, they have a place to stay. In other words, the, the top 1% or the top 0.1% have more than one place to live. And so I said, this is not going to help our housing problems. And someone in the city government said to me, oh, but rich people always have more than one house. It just brings tax money. It's, don't worry about it. Right. We'll keep building more until we can house people. So I think that there's an idea that you just let them build what they want, and it's worse than that because then they give them right. tax abatements. But So, yeah, I mean, we talked about how the local housing debate gets kind of heated. I feel like this has become very apparent in talking about the policies of the Industrial Development Agency, or the IDA, and the sort of, you know, programs they have to... You know, there have been a series of large projects recently, some of which are housing focused, in which they hand out tax abatements uh, to large development projects under the rationale of they need some kind of incentive to be able to build it. It may be, say, luxury housing, but because of filtration, sort of offering this public money to a high-end housing project, is in fact a responsible approach to addressing an affordable housing shortage. So that's sort of the manifestation of people talking about filtration. Is they say, because of filtration, we can hand away this money um, to rich developers, and it's in fact helping the poor of Ithaca. Well, and then another justification is that it's not giving them money, it's taking less money right. from them now in exchange for property taxes later on for on properties that they might not build right. if they didn't get these breaks early on. Um, since we assume that the county, the, the city and the county have limited amounts of abatements that they can give away without right. breaking the bank, um, choosing to focus them on high-end housing is distorting the market even more. Right. Well, I would say there's a perception that people like us who agitate for using these tax abatements wisely don't understand that we're not losing any tax money. That right now, it's 
this land is worth a million, so we get that money. So the developer will still pay us that money. We'll get as much as we were getting, and then when the $10 million development is done, we'll get 10 times as much money. We're not losing anything. But what we say is, we understand that argument, but what you're doing is you're giving away your influence. You're not getting enough in exchange. You should be demanding that some in affordable housing be included. So that this is a valuable thing to the developer. So, okay, they'll build this thing if you defer some of the tax that you'll collect, but in exchange for that value, demand that they include 20% of the units affordable to people at median income or whatever they work out in their policy debate but they should at least be demanding something of those developers and what's the response to that so i would say they generally uh you know in meetings with local officials and you know at public meetings the response tends to be pretty similar to what the developer just tells them which is if you force our hand and make these demands of us, like this development is not going to be profitable enough for us to build it. So they basically cry as poor as they possibly can each time. So they'll say, if you make it 10% affordable housing, we won't build it. Something like that. Do they make the argument that if you put in affordable housing units, higher end renters won't want to live there? because they don't want to live with low-income people? I'm just curious. I, mean, I haven't heard that argument. It's more, it's more financial. It, like, well, one phrase I hate, it won't pencil out. Oh, mm -hmm. if we have mm -hmm. to do this, it won't pencil out and we will walk. And, and I've never heard them say having a mixed income downtown would deter. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, I, I think partially it's that you know, if you're talking to people like us and you're a local official, generally mm -hmm. it's, you, you know, you know everyone in the room wants to try to focus on helping those who are worst off, basically. And that style of argument is maybe less politically Correct. appealing than yeah. sort of arguing that what you're doing is truly helping the poor. But I wouldn't, you know, I'm sure there are people that feel that way locally. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are there other kinds of requirements that are connected to getting tax abatement? You know, environmental, obviously there are zoning requirements that have to be met. I know, I'm, I'm just curious about whether the affordable housing component is particularly not favorable. You know, that they particularly I don't, don't want to include that. I don't know the whole history. I know at one time, every so often they tweak it, and at one time they were wanting living wage jobs, another time they wanted green construction. And I, I don't know uh, the whole history. That Also, we heard from a very productive meeting with the mayor that focusing on, on demanding affordable housing and the tax abatements is, is very um, short-sighted because we do affordable housing through subsidizing INHS and so mm -hmm. forth. And the tax abatement's a very small part of what we do. And to me, that was a bit frustrating because I think it's great that we do subsidized housing, but it will not, it will not be enough. Because even if we had millions of dollars and we handed it to INHS, who builds uh, Section 8 affordable housing, there wouldn't be enough Section 8 vouchers. There's a limited pool of money to help people pay high rents. Um, so what we really need is to focus on affordable housing that's maybe not subsidized, maybe not Section 8, but working working people rents that, that they can realistically pay. And so to say over here we subsidize and over here we give tax abatements for, for fancy things, I think is missing the point that um, if you're going to give those abatements, you can get something. You can ask for more in return. Yeah. And and a lot of people we've talked to in the city seem to be in favor of inclusionary zoning, where you're hired to put a certain number of affordable units in. But I don't see the political will. Yeah. Uh, 
being there to bring it in uh, to places where they could do it easily to start. Uh, and one thing I'd add to your point is, so, yeah, I think, so, you, there are sort of people that argue, if we build the housing, prices will, you know, get to where they need to be, the market will sort it out. There's a more moderate view of, I agree the markets aren't perfect, they won't fully sort it out, but because of INHS, etc., we're doing as much as we can, basically, we've thrown as much public money as we can at the affordable housing problem. And things like these tax abatements are sort of another arrow in the quiver. But I think, going back to Teresa's earlier points, mostly about gentrification, it's not just that filtration can be slow or not work very well, but if you actively gentrify an area, the work in promoting luxury housing can actively undermine the work in promoting affordable housing. So it's not just that you're sort of getting there slower, you might be actively hurting the cause by subsidizing these kinds of developments. I think that's a really good point. So where do you go with it? So, I mean, it, it seems like, as Teresa said, a starting point that at least there's nominal support seems to be something like inclusionary zoning. I, I mean... I, I agree the, the political will maybe among the sort of voters of Ithaca doesn't seem to necessarily be there yet for a policy like that, but I do think you actually need to take pretty bold moves like that. And so inclusionary zoning would affect all new housing, all new housing. regardless yeah. of whether they were applying for an abatement or yeah. subsidy or anything. And I mean generally an implementation People, you know, such policies have exceptions that get bargained, you know, between interest groups and things like that. It's hard to know what exactly a final plan would look like in Ithaca, but it's sort of, yeah, depending on what level of, you know, government you could get to pass such a thing, I really do think you need to start with a pretty, like, wide-ranging thing that's very hard to get around, because... You know, there are plenty of models... Yeah. from other cities of best practices Definitely. but as an example not that this might be right but every new housing 20 percent of the units need to be affordable or you pay into a fund and we use that money to build an affordable mm -hmm. housing over here you know there are other versions uh less strict if you right. 20% affordable, if you make 30% affordable, you can make it a, an extra story mm -hmm. taller. You know, there is an yeah. endless... Right. This is one reason why I think we don't have... We, Ithaca put forward a model a couple of years ago, but didn't pass, and to do another one, you know, there, there's a lot you would, you would need to study. You need right. to study other people's, yeah. uh, and then figure out which ones would work for Ithaca. Right. And but, we have a fund which the city and the county and Cornell contribute to. It's small, but it's a vehicle that's there already that could be used. Um, so have members of Common Council been approached? How has this been looked at politically? Yeah, so I mean my understanding is there have been past proposals that gain some level of traction and sort of died for this or that reason. But, you know, we've had recent meetings both with the mayor and a member of Common Council that, you know, they tell us I'm in favor of this specific policy. So it seems like there's somewhere to get the ball rolling in Ithaca at the very least. What would you say are the next steps? Well, I guess... I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> I think... I mean, we have a couple of contested common council races this year, which is unusual. Has this issue come up in campaigns that you know of? Um, y yes, but it's, uh, I, I would say, um, you know, that there was the, I don't remember which district it is, we should maybe, yeah. One? There's a yeah, three. Well, yeah. Whichever. Yeah. So, uh, it's, but I'm, I'm not actually that well informed on which candidates have which. Right, mine is uh, not contested, so yeah. I haven't paid too much attention. However, <laughs> I think people 
can lobby their common council person, can lobby the mayor. Whenever you run into him around town, say, what's going on with inclusionary zoning? When are we going to get inclusionary zoning? I don't know if we could have a tenants' rights group in Ithaca. Other places have had some success. Tenants' union. Tenants' yeah. union. Uh, because I feel like we're on the cusp of a turning point where we could either become a gentrified city or we could become a vibrant, mixed-income, walkable city. Uh, here's, here's another thing. When uh, an op-ed earlier this year was praising the work of the IDA, and one thing said, oh, by giving these abatements, we've got some of the greenest building and the most walkable. And our position to that is, okay, you've got walkable luxury housing downtown, what we need is walkable housing for the people that actually work downtown. Because if they have to live out of the county, they're not going to be driving a Nissan Leaf or whatever it is. They're going <laughs> to drive an old gas guzzler because they need to work at the um, gas station at 11 o'clock and there's no bus. So to, to really make green building, you need to build something that's going to house the workforce. So I think we're we're at a turning point where yeah. we could maybe push for this and push our our government. Yeah, I mean I think it's sort of there's sort of, you know, classic socialist organizing tenets here, which is, you know, the number of people who it would materially benefit to pursue these kinds of policies clearly outnumber the people who oppose them, at least on material grounds. So whether it's best to organize at the electoral level or something like a tenants union, you know, all of these seem worth pursuing to me, but it's, it seems clear that at least like the people who can be convinced that this benefits them are out there in our city. Okay, obviously a complex situation related to the affordable housing crisis. I've been talking to Tom Eisenberg and Teresa Halpert. Thanks for watching DSA Presents.